Point of order, Mr. Chair. In the context where we're talking about the importance of the health of our interpreters, uh, we're saying that the sound is not, the quality of the sound is not good. Thank you. One moment. Mr. Brock, uh, our interpreters are saying that your your sound quality is bad. I hate to do this. Are you okay if we switch uh, pop over to Mr. Uh, Genuess and we'll have IT contact you? Yes. Okay. Mr. Genuess, are you able to? Uh, we'll just start at five minutes if you're able to go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, I am, uh, Chair, and. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll pick up where Mr. Brock left off, which is that the report indicates that there were three instances of contract splitting. Uh, I wonder if our auditor can just confirm uh, that there are, in fact, instances of contract splitting that were identified uh, and, um, and, and give us some context for her previous response. Yes, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Yes, of course, I was under the impression that her question had to do with uh, the statistical sample. Uh, if there were uh, any incidents of contract splitting, and the answer is no to that question. Of course, my report details three instances where we did find potential contract splitting, and that was related to another type of sampling that we did, which was risk-based. And therefore, uh, we were actually looking for, uh, for some contract splitting. Uh, after uh, validation, verification, well, okay. we did find three uh, okay. instances. Okay, thank th thank you. I mean, I I, I would suggest uh, in in the future you try to be more more precise because I think that lends itself to some significant confusion. Uh, just on the issue of um, of contract splitting further, uh, there's been an effort to portray this as as kind of an instance of oh, you know, we forgot to cross the T's and dot dot the I's. But uh, contract splitting involves uh, intention. It involves somebody knowing what the rules are that a competitive process is required over a certain threshold, and then intentionally trying to uh, divide the contract up in a way that is um, that is not consistent with policies in order to get around policies and avoid needing to do a competitive process. Uh, this is explicitly a kind of corruption, an effort to circumvent the rules in order to avoid a competitive process and benefit somebody. Um, and uh, so I think that needs to be noted in the context of some of the sort of downplaying of these problems that is, is, is going on. Uh, do you have any information about the motivation behind the contract splitting and in the instances of contract splitting, who specifically benefited from it? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, just in terms of the three instances where um, contract um, splitting was, um, was, was mentioned in the audit, um, just to say that those were, were three relatively low uh, dollar value, or sorry, six relatively low dollar. That's not dollar the point. Who benefited? Who benefited? Um, uh, maybe first I could just address um, the... No, no, no. Could you answer the question, please? Who benefited? Point of order, so Mr. You... Point of order Mr. Chair, if, if, if again, my colleague can just allow the witness to uh, answer the question, that would help, I think, all of us here get the information okay. we need. Yeah, just on the same point of order, Mr. Mr. Carruthers spent four minutes not answering question the same question in the last round, so I'm going to be more direct uh, this yeah. time in my expectation that direct uh, direct questions receive direct answers. Uh, and Mr. Thank Kuzmerichuk you. knows that it's my time to do so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kermit, or Kuzmerichuk, it is uh, the member's time. Go ahead, Mr. Genuis. Ms. Carruthers, who benefited from this corrupt contract splitting? Who are the consultants that benefited? I'm actually going to turn um, this over to my uh, colleague, Dan Pilon. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the three instances of contract splitting were, um, were from the same unit from the same manager. So it was a very isolated incident um, in that it was not widespread throughout the department. Is one specific manager of our, uh, of our administrative distribution center. That manager is no longer in the position. Uh, that being said, we have, uh, when we found out about this, we addressed the issue. We addressed it with the person's supervisor. We went in with mandatory training and reassessed uh, or readdressed oh, okay, the sorry. situation. So this, this, this person you're telling us was involved with multiple cases of corrupt contract splitting. You said they're no longer in the position. Uh, I hear that as saying they still work for the government. Does that person still work for the government of Canada? Um, I do not know personally if this person, I think they are still within the department, although I don't know specifically okay, their tenure. Okay. So they were moved to a different, you, you don't know for sure, but you say they were likely moved to a different position within the department. Uh, could you, uh, I would like you to provide to the committee uh, the name of that individual and the current position that they hold. Uh, if you have that information, you can provide it now. If you don't, you can follow up in writing. Are you prepared to do that? Um, so I, I will not provide it now. I don't have that information, but if you require it, we okay. will provide it. Yes. Yeah, we'll, 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 re we'll require that in, in writing uh, according to the timelines that we, that we usually require. Who are the consultants that benefited from these instances of contract splitting? Who got the deals? Um, so Who got the money? I, I will answer if you don't mind. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, this was a one company uh, which was used for, uh, you know, again, uh, temporary help services. Uh, where they where they provide services of help of, of staff and so forth. So there was uh, three instances. What's the instances. name of the company? Um, I will get that to you in 30 seconds. I think it is, put my glasses on. Yes, it is uh, Excel HR, Excel Human Resources. Excel HR, okay. I, I, I assume if I request it, we'll have agreement of the committee to bring Excel HR to provide testimony. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Uh, has Melanie Jolie been briefed on this audit? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I don't know if she was specifically briefed, but I do know that her um, her office has been briefed of the results of this audit. Okay, who I, would have briefed her? I, I sorry, I have to interrupt. We are past okay. our time. Uh, Mr. Baines, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for our um, witnesses for joining us uh, from the department. Um, uh, um, you know, I, I requested to sit on the OGO committee uh, to look at, you know, improving operations of government, finding efficiencies, and the work you're doing here, reviewing procurement, and ultimately is to find those efficiencies. And my understanding is that the report, this report was a routine audit um, conducted under the approved 2023-2025 Global Affairs Canada risk-based audit plan. So can you maybe explain how um, the plan was developed and approved? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And I'll actually uh, turn this one to my colleague, uh, Natalie Lalonde. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Mr. Thank Chair. Um, so every year uh, we do a risk assessment of the operations of the department with the resources that we have we determine a certain number of engagements that we do take. Now internal audit is a fairly uh, policy based uh, function where there are certain rules we need to uh, to apply we do have actually we have a, an independent departmental audit committee uh, that actually supports the operations and supports gives advice and guidance to the deputy heads. And that committee is, um, uh, is uh, uh, composed of four external members outside of the uh, public service. Um, and therefore, uh, how we would present the report, uh, we present it to, uh, to the Departmental Audit Committee. Uh, they review, they ask a lot of questions, uh, and uh, if they agree, they recommend for approval by the Deputy Minister. Uh, Optimately, uh, ultimately, uh, the, um, the approval is uh, obtained by the Deputy Minister and therefore we can go ahead with the work that we have planned. And then what risk factors does it take into consideration? It takes several risk factors into consideration. Uh, we look at, uh, gosh, <laughs> I'd like to show you the spreadsheet, but it's, it's so wide and large. Uh, we, uh, we try uh, to- Okay, how, then how does the plan lead to specific audits being conducted? 
how many risk factors does it need yeah. to hit before you know the audit is now conducted? What we do is is once we we complete our risk assessment, we look at the potential uh, engagements we can do during the year, and we prioritize that uh, that certain list uh, specifically. My, my, a concern I have is we've seen procurement contract. We've discussed this in this committee before. Um, in many instances, the, the procurement process hasn't changed for over 20 years. Um, and and again, then one of the issues is we find that um, you know contractors, subcontractors, many know one another. They they work on several different um, um, you know uh, duties and the relationships over time are built, these sort of things. So I'm just wondering, like, how are all of these things mitigated? I'm sorry, I thank you very much for the question. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, the reason why we did this audit, why we do, uh, we do several contracting audits within a five or six year period. Uh, understanding the, um, uh, the issues that were uh, arisen from other uh, departments and other uh, audits that were uh, published uh, last year, uh, we decided and we thought it was important for us to actually look at our own practices uh, and uh, report proactively uh, the results of those uh, of the assessment and therefore we published the report on our um, on our uh, website. Okay, can you, given the significant series of world events uh, that uh, Global Affairs has responded to over the five-year period. Um, there's a significant number of consulting services contracts. Uh, can you outline the breadth of the consulting services that GAC uh, contracts for? Um, do you want to answer? Um, thank you very much for what the activities. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, one thing, a couple of figures that I can give you here. I mean, over the last uh, last five years, um, the department has entered into contracts for um, over three billion dollars. Um, and I think that these contracts uh, span a number of, uh, of areas, including, um, you know, our security guards at missions abroad, construction, um, various services and whatnot. Um, so we do have um, a vast array of uh, pro pro uh, procurement and contracting um, that, de that the department uh, does do. So like security at consular services, um, um, you know, uh, maybe international development, international trade. And can you give me some examples in there? Um, and so our department does um, have uh, some funding um, that's reserved specifically um, in order um, to um, uh, address uh, issues at our, at our uh, embassies just in terms of security. So it's called our duty of care. Um, and so certainly um, we do have some contracts that we enter into um, using that uh, source of funds. Um, and those contracts are predominantly for um, hiring security guards, for example, at our missions abroad. Um, also hiring um, different vendors um, to help with maintenance and uh, the like um, in terms of our um, vast mission portfolio. Can you maybe explain how, like, historically, uh, the volume uh, compares historically what we have been uh, and what's what has been now the longer longer term trends? Um, if I'm if I'm kind of going back to uh, seventeen eighteen, um, just in terms of the number of contracts that the department entered into, um, we're looking at about fifteen um, hundred uh, contracts. Um, in comparison, in 23-24, uh, um, the volume of contracts has decreased significantly. Um, and so it's almost by half. So um, 7,676, um, which I do think that uh, these numbers do reflect um, and are in line um, with the direction um, of the government. If you think about um, the, uh, the recent refocusing government spending exercise, um, all government departments um, were asked to reduce um, professional services. And so I think um, just the, this number really demonstrates, um, you know, what we've done within the department uh, to reduce our spending on consulting services. But like I mentioned, um, we do have a lot of consulting services that are um, unavoidable in terms of our uh, contracting for security guards at Missions Abroad. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Block, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. So we now know 
that there is a widespread problem of government officials working as contractors and getting contracts from the Government of Canada. The most infamous case, of course, is a ride scam. Contractor Dalian paid $9 million on the app and was also working at DND. In fact, he signed a contract with the government on the very first day he started working at DND. Treasury Board submitted documents to this committee on all conflicts of interest from government officials working as contractors. It included information from Global Affairs. They claim one official signed a contract and there was no conflict. But in the audit, it was clearly stated that one contract was approved by an individual who benefited from that contract. Is this not a direct conflict of interest? Uh, thank you very much for the question, um, and I do welcome the opportunity um, to clarify um, that particular situation. Um, and so the one instance um, within the audit um, where an individual benefited um, from the transaction, it was actually um, a contract that was put in place for coaching services for one of our, um, one of our managers within the department. Um, the contract was for a value of under $5,000, and it was split over two fiscal years. In this, in this so, instance... So I'm just going to stop you there because I don't think the dollar amount matters, and I don't think that it was extended over two years. Do you not consider this a direct conflict of interest? Oh, if thanks. someone who works in a department is getting a contract from that same department. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so in this particular instance, um, what happened was the employee put in place a contract um, for coaching services, ha um, and then when the invoice came in, the invoice was scheduled to be paid from her manager from her manager's fund center, um, but in this instance, that manager was actually acting on behalf of her manager when the invoice came in, and she signed um, for that contract. Now, by um, regulations, um, that employee was in the wrong, and they should not have signed that um, payment because they did benefit from the transaction, but what I can say is that um, it was not um, malintended, um, and I think it was just an administrative oversight. Um, Thank we you. Have Thank you. How many cases of conflict interest, conflict of interest, do you have at Global Affairs? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that information. Okay, but I'm, I'm sure you'll be willing to provide that to the committee. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, will you also commit to reviewing all contracts, the recipients, and those who approve the contracts? Uh, I th uh, thank you very much for the question. I think um, we would have to have further details on, on, um, on what you're asking for. This would be in particular to the conflict of interest that you've said you will provide the information on. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'll take that back uh, to the department and uh, we'll provide you with, um, with information accordingly. So you've given us the position that the person was in. You've given us some explanation around how they actually didn't, didn't benefit. Does this individual, because they were in the wrong in signing off on this contract, uh, was there any sort of reprimand or reprisals uh, in follow-up to that? Thank you very much for the question. In this particular instant, again, um, you know, it was the position of the department that this wasn't necessarily wrongdoing. Um, this was more of a of a an error on her part in terms of, you know, she really shouldn't have signed that. She was acting on behalf of her manager. The invoice came in, and I think um, she she should have waited um, and had that invoice signed off when her um, when her supervisor returned. Unfortunately, um, I think. I can't speak for the employee. I'm assuming she, she wanted the vendor um, to be paid promptly um, within the terms of the contract. Um, but um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, what we have seen in many of the contracting issues that we have studied at this committee is a broad failure to, for, to enforce the Financial Administration Act, and I think that's been noted by others uh, who've, who have conducted investigations. Who is responsible for ensuring that the Financial Administration Act is properly enforced in a department. Uh, thank and you very perhaps much. in yours in particular. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, under the FAA, um, the deputy head is ultimately responsible for ensuring um, that um, the Financial Administration Act is respected. Um, obviously, as the chief financial officer um, within the department, I have a very important role, um, and that really is to make sure that the necessary controls are in place to ensure um, that the uh, Financial Administration um, Act is respected, um, and as does our okay. auditor. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm afraid um, that's in our the time. Case of the I'm sorry, that's our time, Mrs. Block. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kuzmirchuk. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, you know, over the last two years, I'm, I've been very pleased to be part of the uh, the work of uh, of Ogo Committee um, that's provided an, a, a significant level of scrutiny uh, to uh, to procurement. Uh, two contracts, making sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to be accountable uh, to taxpayers, to Canadians, and making sure uh, that uh, other folks in the procurement and contract business are also being accountable as well, too, so that we're protecting taxpayers. And so uh, over the last uh, year or so, we've seen uh, an RCMP investigation. We've seen uh, an auditor general's uh, providing a report. We've seen a procurement ombudsman uh, delve deep into the procurement and contract system. Our very own OGO committee uh, has had uh, numerous uh, meetings. Um, Rive Can, for example, 64 witnesses. Uh, McKinsey, 59 witnesses. Uh, there's been a pri privacy commissioner uh, report. A public sector integrity, integrity commissioner has been asked to, to look into it. Uh, CBSA has done its own in integrity uh, investigation. And now, obviously, we have uh, Global Affairs Canada as well to proactively looking at contracts and procurement. So a tremendous level of scrutiny. Thus far, uh, what we found, what all of that work has found is that um, uh, more documentation is required. Uh, so we've seen gaps in, in documentation. Uh, we need stronger uh, record keeping, especially uh, dis around decisions, uh, around the decisions that are made around contracts. Um, and uh, what we haven't found is any political interference uh, in, in all the investigations and studies that we've done. We've seen no political interference uh, in, uh, in the contracts. Uh, so that's sort of the state of play uh, that we're in. And it's interesting, over the last year and a half, the biggest whopper or revelation that we've seen is actually from today, when we saw the Conservative Party, a report in the CBC states that the Conservative Party is actually abusing taxpayers by charging them, uh, by billing them $426,000 for partisan uh, political activity, which anyone that's been an MP for any measurable period of time knows that it is illegal. It is, it is outside of the rules to charge uh, House of Commons budget and the taxpayer for clearly partisan and political events. And here the Conservative Party has been found out. They've been misappropriating uh, taxpayer funding uh, and abusing the taxpayer. And really this is robbery in uh, what I would describe as robbery in, in plain sight, uh, basically sending taxpayers the bill for purely political, partisan, conservative uh, events. And I think that's something that my colleagues around this table uh, really need to uh, 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 to respond to, and I certainly hope that they delve into this misappropriation of, of taxpayer funds. Uh, this is uh, this is a serious uh, serious uh, issue. Um, now, my question to our our officials from uh, Global Affairs. Uh, so, in the United States, we've seen over the last number of months, we've seen the MAGA Republicans uh, blocking uh, military aid to Ukraine uh, in the U.S. Congress. And what that has done, uh, that has placed uh, Ukraine at a disadvantage. We're seeing Russia making military advances right now in Ukraine. So that's MAGA, MAGA Republicans in the U.S. On the Canadian side, we saw uh, the leader of the opposition and the Conservative Party Point try to, order, to block. Mr. Chair. Sorry, excuse me, Mr. Kuzmirchuk. Mrs. Block, go ahead. Yes, point of order. Um, I know this member has trouble sticking to the matters at hand when it comes to his interventions. I would uh, simply point out relevance to his intervention so far. 
as it uh, as it, it lines up with the uh, study or the questioning of the witnesses before us on the audit report. Thanks very much. Uh, it is Mr. Kuzmirchuk's time if he wishes to uh, go on for this. That well, is thank you, Mr. Chair. Time. Go and, ahead. And so again, uh, in the U.S., we saw MAGA Republicans blocking military aid to Ukraine. In Canada, we're seeing uh, MAGA conservatives uh, trying to block support for the Ukrainian free trade deal. And I just wanted to ask our, our uh, global affairs uh, officials whether this is something that perhaps um, you would be looking at, you know, the contracts that you have to the consultants. Is this the type of issues uh, that would be looked at by perhaps some of these consultants, looking at what the impact uh, is on uh, on uh, support uh, for Ukraine and the possible impact on, on the war in Ukraine. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm not aware of uh, any any contracts in, in that area that I could really speak to. Okay, no problem. Uh, so I wanted to I wanted to move on to my next question then. Uh, in the Globe and Mail uh, last year, there was an article that was titled "Germany's Far Right." isn't on the doorstep of power, it's already arrived. And it was talking about the alarming level of support for far-right parties, like the Alternative for Germany, which is the AFD party. Uh, what we've seen is, again, conservative MPs... Okay, Mr. Uh, Kismir, actually, you're out of time. Can you wrap up with a question? Oh, sure. I just wanted to say, last year we saw conservative MPs having lunch with the sure, extremist AFD party. He's out of time, AF, out of time the and party. To, Sorry. Uh, to his, uh, Thanks, Mr. Generous. Mr. Kismir, check you are past the clock. Could you wrap up with a very brief question? I, I just wanted to ask if some of that consulting is around the impact that, uh, again, the Conservatives meeting with far-right extremist groups from Germany. Are we looking at the okay. impact that has on anti-democratic... Point of order. That is our, yeah. Point of order. We, we, Mr. Kismir, Chuck, I gave you twice to wrap up, and we're well past the time now, so unless it's... I'm ready to move on to our next uh, intervention. Was there a point of order, Mr. Brock, or is this settled? Yes, we can he's, move well on? he's well past his time, and all yeah. he's doing is editorializing. He's not asking a question. Thanks. Time to move on. Yeah, we have finished. Not a point of order, thanks, but I appreciate you bringing it up. We are now going to move to uh, Ms. LaRouche for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm a little bit confused about uh, some points today. Uh, I'm a bit uh, mixed up, so I have two things. It's a point uh, with uh, questions. Uh, I'm looking this 109 more public servants in one year, 357,000 in 2023. And uh, 368,000 in 2024. So about 109,000 more. So we have more public servants. So to my answer, why use more consultants? I'm being told, well, we have fewer resources. I don't understand. If we have more public servants, uh, we have more resources. Why are we? Uh, doing more outsourcing. And Mr. Pilon, uh, you uh, told me that McKinsey had not received any contracts briefly, but we know all the problems that there were with uh, McKinsey. But it was a bit more difficult to get the name of Excel Human Resources, and it wasn't clear in terms of the um, public servant who may have been uh, fired or not. So I don't know if Mr. Pilon or uh, Ms. Carruthers, if you have any uh, clarification uh, to give to uh, the questions that I'm asking myself. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm uh, unable to uh, talk about the number of employees in the public service. That's not part of my uh, domain of expertise. Well, I'm sorry. So it took me a while to get uh, the name of the company. I had to take my glasses. That being said, the employee in question, the manager, whose name we will be uh, providing to you, that point was addressed with the employee and uh, his or her supervisor. And it was very uh, clear and it was explained that the processes that this manager used were not acceptable. 
and measures were taken, which are probably uh, related to staffing and employment in terms of the reprimand, but I'm not uh, aware of that. But so this employee is where now, Mr. Pino? And uh, I can't give you this information. I don't have it with me. We have 6,000 employees uh, at our uh, department. I don't have that information on hand. Oui, oui, je suis certain. Yes, we will. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Ms. Cirillo, please go ahead for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to just revisit about the data privacy and certainly in the lens of the foreign interference uh, that we've been talking about in Parliament. So five years ago, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner uh, issued an alert around contracting out and that that's, those services can raise certain risks for privacy. So I think about Canadians here and that it's important to consider privacy implications. And uh, they did go ahead and under federal government institutions made some recommendations such as defining ownership of the information when contracting out, recognizing individuals' rights of access to their personal information in regards to contracting out, restricting further use of personal data to those contractors, protecting information and unauthorized dis- un- unauthorized disclosure, and then to have written into contracts, establishing retention and disposal criteria. All of that is top of mind uh, for uh, me and the NDP right now as we think about protecting Canadians. Is this something that uh, has been uh, taken on and adopted in regards to outsourcing Thank you very uh, much. For the, oh, thank you very much for the question. Um, and yes, this is something um, definitely that uh, Global Affairs has addressed. And perhaps I can turn to my colleague Dan Pilon, who can provide you with some additional details. Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. Every contract that is awarded by uh, by Global Affairs, uh, as per government policy, goes through uh, an assessment. Uh, So there is, you've probably heard this before, a security requirements checklist, which is a standard procedure where an analysis is made on the sensitivity linked to the contract, either privacy, national security, communication security, and so forth. So there's a, a thorough review that is done. That form is then used to feed consultation within the department if security sensitivities are then identified. Uh, experts are brought in. If that is the case, we determine an appropriate uh, path to procurement that safeguards that information or that subject matter and so forth. So every single contract in the government of Canada, and especially global affairs, is supposed to undergo that analysis. Our review has demonstrated that we routinely use uh, this form, uh, and definitely for anything over $10,000 for which a actual physical contract sorry, is issued. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Pilon. I'm just going to clarify. So I'm, I'm, I'm really want to know about people's personal information, if that's protected and if that's written into contracts when outsourcing. And then my follow-up question to that would be is that, is that information accessible? Information that's held by an outsourced organization, is that access, accessible, uh, whether it's around ATIP or any kind of transparency questions from residents or constituents of Canada? Thanks. I'm afraid we're past our time again, but perhaps you'll have one more intervention, Ms. Cirillo, or perhaps we'll get it in writing. Uh, I'll leave it up to you in our next intervention. We're going to try Mr. Brock again. Mr. Brock, can you just give us a few words and we'll check with the translation? Yes, I hope I'm coming through loud and clear without uh, causing any harm to our excellent uh, translators. I had some good assistance from the IT team over the last half an hour. Any issues? One moment. It appears your volume is is coming in quite low. Why don't we start, and then if uh, there are problems with the translation, we'll have to uh, probably skip over to uh, Ms. Block or Ms. Uh, Genoas. But why don't you uh, start, Mr. Brock? Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, Question uh, to uh, you, Ms. Lalonde. Uh, Much earlier in the meeting, you uh, 
provided a response uh, to a question about the uh, procurement process uh, at uh, Global Affairs. And you made a comment that the process is complex, your words. I'm gonna push back and I'm gonna suggest to you the process is not complex with respect to procurement across all ministries, particularly your ministry, when the people who are in charge of the procurement actually honestly do their job and follow the rules. Would you agree with that? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. President. Yes, I would. Thank you. Uh, to you, Ms. Carruthers, again, earlier in this meeting, you made a couple of comments that piqued my interest. Uh, one is that uh, you are firmly of the belief, notwithstanding this damning uh, report from, uh, from the Auditor Department, that you delivered value for money, you delivered value for Canadians, your words and that you're also of the mindset that there is no evidence of wrongdoing with respect to the factual findings of a very small sample, a sample of under 100 contracts over, over 8,000 contracts in total over this four-year period, a fail rate of up to close to 25%. You determine there's no evidence of wrongdoing. You may, you may conclude that there's been instances of irregularities, but I view this from a different lens. I view this from the lens of a former Crown attorney for 30 years. And uh, there is clear examples in my view of criminality here and outright corruption. The Trudeau government, um, the whole department with respect to procurement and contracting in general is just rife with abuse and mismanagement. And it's point, a of, point of order, point of order, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, yep. uh, Mr. Brock is is completely, uh, you know, misdirect, misdirecting and and misinforming and and uh, this committee. That's not a point of order, Chair. Okay, on, on, on the I, I, that will I will I will decide what's a point of order or not and uh, make your comment brief, Mr. Genuis. Uh, I would just refer Mr. Kuzmerichuk to the scripture I referred to earlier okay. about trying to Thank you, Mr. Generous. Mr. Kuzmerichuk, uh, it's not a point of order, and I will comment. Uh, I find it very ironic this coming from you after your last uh, intervention. I don't think anyone should be throwing rocks inside of glass houses. Mr. Brock, continue, please. Yes, so the the, the culture of abuse and mismanagement in the Justin Trudeau government is alive and well at global affairs. The instances of irregularities that you call it, I call it corruption, no signed contracts, yet money was paid out, contracts signed for services rendered after the fact, one contract signed by an individual who benefited from the transaction, contracts splitting. Appel au règlement, Monsieur le Président. Okay. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Translation again. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. The sound was a poor quality. We're obviously having lots of tech issues today. Um, do you want to just back up? Is there still a problem? Let me Is just still check. A problem, with... Chair? Yeah, I'm afraid uh, we're just, it's just not coming. You're perfectly loud and clear inside the room. Unfortunately, just for the translation, uh, there is some uh, glitch. Perhaps, uh, Mr. There's uh, two minutes and 20 seconds left. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Genuis or Ms. Block can finish off. Mr. Genuis, go uh, ahead, please, for two minutes and 20 seconds. Thank you. We heard earlier about a case where an employee was put uh, had put in place a contract for an outside consultant to give them $5,000 worth of coaching services. Uh, and then that employee signed for that contract. Obviously, uh, that employee broke the rules when they signed the contract for themselves. Um, but moreover, I wanna ask, is it common at Global Affairs for officials to be able to hire outside consultants to provide them with coaching services? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, and uh, yes, uh, this type of activity um, is permitted. Is it common? I don't know if I would say common. I mean, it's not uncommon. Um, we'd have to do a, a bit of a sample just in terms of the actual numbers. But, um, you know, it's something yeah, that happens. Could you, could you do that? And could you provide the committee back with a list of 
the number of instances uh, that uh, outside consultants were hired to provide coaching services. Uh, we would we would request that within the the usual time frame. Um, have you ever thought about like setting up an internal mentorship process or something so you don't have to hire outside consultants? Why why doesn't why don't you have the, the expertise for people to be able to coach and support each other without, without bringing in um, external consultants for these these expensive kind of nebulous uh, advice contracts? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, just to say yes, uh, we do have several mentorship programs um, within the department, and I think you know if I think about, um, we actually have a, a school within the department that provides um, a lot of training services to our um, employees. Um, Perfect. So why why in the world these these contracting out for a for a life coach or something? It just doesn't doesn't make any sense to me that, that the government would spend money hiring external consultants to provide coaching when you already have clearly the internal capacity to provide mentorship and support within the public service? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think that the hiring of professional services for, for things like coaching is something um, that is done across um, all government departments. Um, and, and of course, um, this, wow. you know, it's... Well, let's, let's start at Global Affairs. Will you provide the information requested then to the committee? Certainly. Thank you very Thank you. much. We'll go to uh, Mr. Zwari, please, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to go back to uh, Ms. Crowther. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk around the, the type of uh, professional services uh, and uh, the the amounts uh, over the last um, last two hours. Uh, there naturally, there's 8,000 contracts that uh, it's been highlighted over five years or six years. Uh, can you give me some idea, even if you could kind of classify the top three type of services that foreign affairs received, top three services that international trade received, top three services that international development and even some of our counselor um, services received to be able to put it into perspective what type of services and what kind of dollar value are we talking about? Thank you very much for the question um, and maybe first I'll clarify that the 8,000 um, in contracts was for one uh, particular um, type of contracting services um, but Dan can certainly um, provide you with some details in terms of all of the different classes that uh, you inquired about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So just uh, at a very high level, um, the number one um, expenditure of, of global affairs uh, in contracting is for services which are in support of our mission operations. So uh, there's two categories of that. So there's one which is uh, things like uh, protective services and security guard and duty of care. Um, and then the other is uh, management consulting services or uh, that are linked to our uh, support of our mission uh, infrastructure. So uh, architects, engineers, uh, things like that, as we renovate and build our mission network and do uh, improvements to that, we do require professional services uh, that are qualified in the geographical and, and legal environment across the world. So we do a lot of outsourcing of that. Um, for the development, uh, international development portfolio, our biggest spend is what we call uh, our field support services. And those are uh, professional services that assist us to deliver our development mandate across the world. So a lot of times it's facilitating the, the use of uh, transportation uh, over there, uh, things like uh, office space when we need to set up, uh, things like uh, event uh, organization. So, and f uh, their support services made in country, in foreign countries, to help us deliver our mandate. With that, we also have a strong uh, regime of monitoring and evaluation. So we send in auditors uh, and uh, evaluators to go in and monitor how successful our programs are and how we're doing on the development or the delivery of development and international aid. So these are professional services that supplement uh, global affairs personnel to evaluate our programs. Uh, and lastly, the last spend, which is mostly on the regular government operation, is obviously uh, your your IT consultants, uh, your management consultant, HR consultants, things like that, uh, expert witnesses uh, for international negotiations, and so forth. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. So can you give me a sense of um, ratio and if there's been any changes um, uh, during the period that you did your audit? 
have you seen the same level of services needed that you talked about in the past as it's happening now or it happened in that future? And what do you see as a trajectory uh, uh, going forward? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think that's something I could maybe point to is just in terms of the category that we call services. Um, back in 2017-18, uh, um, we had 403 million um, in services, and if we think about last uh, last fiscal year, for instance, um, it was 259. Um, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, procurement across all of our different lines um, has decreased um, over the last five years. Great. So, do, do you see the same trajectory going through? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I would uh, I would say um, yes. Um, you know, given uh, the recent refocusing government spending, um, the reference levels or the budget of the department was reduced um, for professional services by fifteen percent. Um, and so the department is committed um, to um, reduce our spending um, in that area. Um, and so um, I would uh, I would I would expect there to be a uh, decrease in uh, expenditures in the next fiscal year. Uh, thank you. I have about 15 seconds, which I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jouari. We're now in our final round. It's uh, going to go to Mr. Genuis, then Ms. Atwin, and then finish up with uh, Ms. LaRouche and uh, Ms. Uh, Zarillo. Go ahead, please, Mr. Uh, Genuis. Okay, I'm going to try to go rapid fire here. Uh, will you provide uh, the RCMP access to problematic files in relation to this audit? Uh, certainly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Global Affairs has given over 8,000 contracts in the last five years. How many of those uh, outside consultants also do work for foreign governments? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, none that I'm aware of. Okay, do you track this information? Do you ask? Uh, uh, we, we, we know McKinsey's done a lot of work for the government. Of course, they work extensively with uh, our strategic rivals. So are you seeking this information? Um, thank you very much for the question. I'm actually going to ask my colleague, Dan Pilon, uh, to provide some specific details. So we do business with a lot of companies across the world. Uh, m m some of them are multinational companies. So we would have to assume, just as a general sense, that yes, we, they do do business with foreign governments and so forth. Um, when sensitive issues arise, again, we do a security assessment, and that, that drives the decision in procurement as to who we do business with. Okay, I, I will just point out the obvious, Mr. Pilon, that your your answer just explicitly contradicted the answer the Assistant Deputy Minister gave about 30 seconds prior. Uh, do you track, uh, in general, the client lists of these multinational companies so that you would be able to say for certain this company we're, we're doing uh, business with uh, does uh, or does not do business with a, a strategic rival? Do you... Do you um, do you, do you meticulously get that information, or do you just make assumptions? Um, thank you for the questions. We do, I can confirm that we do not track the uh, consultants or companies' clients list. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, forthright, though troubling uh, uh, response. Um, uh, you you weren't able to say if Minister Jolie was briefed uh, on on this audit, but that her office was told uh, has. Has she issued any new directives or changed any policies uh, in response to this latest report? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, as I've mentioned, um, you know, the department has been very seized with the results of this audit and has been working towards implementing a number of um, activities in order Sorry, to Sorry, that's not the question. Well, has Mr. I, Jolie uh, I can issued say new directives or changed policies in response to the report? Uh, perhaps not uh, directly in response to this. However, um, you know, she is very okay. involved in the GAC transformation and a lot of the initiatives okay. that are implemented I, in the GAC. I'm sorry, she's, she's very involved, but you're not sure if she's been briefed. Uh, thank you very much for How the question. How do I make sense of those, those just, two things? Just to clarify, um, what I was saying was that she's very involved in our overall uh, global affairs transformation, um, and that when I think, you know, some of the initiatives that are actually in our global affairs transformation... No, no, but, but you, understand my, my, you should understand my, my confusion. How, how can one be very involved if, if one has not been briefed on this audit? Like, but, it, it would seem to me the, the, the foundational uh, uh, step in involvement... Uh, in the transformation or structural issues in global affairs in general would be to receive 
a, a briefing uh, on this critical audit, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Well, thank you very much for, for, the, um, for the question. I would say um, I'm, uh, I would have to ask her staff if they've actually briefed her on the outcome of this audit. Um, the practice um, would be for us to brief her, her employees on this type okay, of information. Okay, well, well on, on that basis, Chair, I, I suspect you will find agreement of the committee to invite Minister Jolie to testify on this. Uh, Mr. Kusmirchuk, are you pining on or opining on this? Or yeah, so uh, I don't think that there is, uh, you know, I don't think that there is um, uh, grounds uh, at this point. Uh, again, these are contracts that have zero okay. political I'm, I'm gonna, involvement. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there. Um, I'm going to take it that uh, we don't have UC, and I'll get the time back to Mr. Genuus. Okay, well, Chair, I, I will move that we invite uh, Minister Jolie then, and, and we can have a vote and, and see where members stand on it. Uh, the fact is, in, in, in my line of questioning, it's just been made very clear that the officials uh, cannot speak to uh, whether the minister was informed, uh, what she knows, the extent to which she is involved or not in this issue. She is responsible for the department. Uh, uh, I do not suppose that that she personally signed off on every one of or necessarily any of these 8,000 uh, contracts, although, although maybe in some cases. Uh, but the, the, the principal point here is that uh, there's, this, um, um, there's this very significant audit uh, that shows very significant problems in contracting within her department. Um, and officials are not able to answer questions about uh, what she knew when, uh, what actions she has taken, uh, or if and when uh, she was briefed and and uh, her engagement with the follow-up on that. Uh, insofar as we have a system of ministerial accountability, I think we should hear about the minister, from the minister about these matters. So uh, I will simply move, uh, as I said, that, uh, that the committee invite the minister to testify on this matter for two hours. Thanks. I see Mr. Kusmirchuk and then Mr. Shawari. Yeah, I would just ask... Uh, Mr. Chair, again, uh, that uh, that we suspend uh, for uh, just so we can have a uh, read through this uh, this motion and and uh, and if that can also be circulated and translated to all the committee members, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, it's because it's such a simple motion, just to have the uh, the minister attend for two hours, I don't see a reason to suspend or to spend the time circulating it. Um, you can stay I, on the... I, we would, I, I, would, I would ask for a suspension, Mr. Chair. Again, like I said, this would provide us with an opportunity, my team, this is uh, uh, to have a, a discussion about this, please. A short suspension. Fine. Uh, one minute suspension because we're running uh, late. But one minute we'll suspend. In. Uh, I've got Mr. Jouari on the speaking order. Go ahead, Mr. Jouari. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and I think the, uh, the the conclusion that we are reaching, the fact that uh, Minister was not directly uh, updated by the Deputy Minister does not uh, mean that uh, the Minister was not updated by by her staff. So that that's 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 um, that's a very um, 
that's a very wrong conclusion to to reach and use that as a base to to call the minister to come. So um, I, I, I don't think we have enough grounds to be able to uh, call it the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, um, Madam uh, Cordero did not personally brief the minister um, would constitute the fact that the minister was not briefed and the minister is not aware of the situation and um, whether the other ministers were not briefed and they were not aware of the situation. And uh, you know, I think when you look at the, the, the world that, uh, that we are in right now, let, let's talk about um, something that started a couple of years ago. Let's start talk about the, the challenge we had with supply chain. And then um, uh, NAFTA, which translated it to Kuzma. Shortly after that, we were having conflict in um, in Russia and Ukraine, and then Azerbaijan and, uh, and, and Armenia, and where we actually opened up a, a new mission. And then the, the challenge that we have in, 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 in Middle East. Um, I, I believe if we look at the priorities that, meant that any of those ministers have and the agenda that the Minister of Trade has, specifically around Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and how we are trying to make sure that we build the strong partnership that we need in the Indo-Pacific region, as well as international uh, development minister. So um, when, when we look at the agenda that the government has and the level of complexity and the level of the sensitivity of the time, um, even if the minister did not get briefed directly by Madam uh, Cordrez, I, I, I not, I don't think this is constitutionalized. Uh, uh, constitute uh, calling the minister uh, being called over because they're, they're, they're bigger priorities. Therefore, looking at that uh, and looking at the fact that uh, you know one. Uh, absence of one does not necessarily mean the, the absence of other updates to the minister, um, you know, uh, within the priorities for all the three ministers, I don't think is justified for us at this time to, to call any minister uh, to come in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Kuzmirchuk. Actually, and before we go to you, um, it's one minute to three, uh, I'm going to excuse our witnesses because we've hit uh, our three o'clock time. Before you go, though, if you would uh, get back to us on one thing we'd asked previously, but we haven't heard, that's from PSPC. If you recall the Nuke Tech issue from a few years ago, would you provide to the committee who CBSA finally chose for the scanners at our embassies once uh, the government stepped, stepped back from the Nuke Tech? If you could just get back to us. Okay. Yes, we can get back to you on our procurement of additional scanners, yes. Perfect. Thanks. Mr. Kuzmirchuk, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, Chair, how much time do we have for uh, resources? Just curious. I'm looking at, uh, at the time. I've got nothing but time for you, Mr. Kuzmirchuk. Go ahead. Okay. Is there, are we, are we scheduled for, uh, do we have resources? We don't have a lot of, future? we don't have a lot of resources. No, sir. Okay. Until what time, Chair? Uh, about 3.04. Okay. So I suggest you uh, start talking if you, if you want to get something in the next few minutes. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so when we looked at this, uh, this report that uh, Global Affairs uh, Canada uh, proactively uh, brought forward uh, and published, as part of their, uh, as part of their uh, uh, their plan, their uh, their own per, their own uh, departmental uh, plans uh, to make sure that uh, they can strengthen their processes when it comes to procurement and contracts. Uh, they looked at um, over a five year period. They had signed eight thousand contracts, uh, which was worth a total of half a billion dollars, and so. They went through this audit process, again, proactively. It's something that was part of their audit plan. And they looked at 100 contracts. And they looked at 100 contracts. And what they found from the 100 contracts is when they looked at uh, the contracts that were awarded, these were contracts that were valued at less than $40,000 for the non-competitive contracts. Um, 
and they looked at those contracts and what they found is that 90% of them had a document documented rationale for not soliciting bids uh, 90% and so uh the the remaining uh perhaps needed to strengthen some of their documentation here but 90% had a documented uh, rationale for not soliciting bids and these are contracts that are under $40,000 these are contracts that uh the decision uh, for whether to award those contracts or not is uh, is not at the ministerial level. It's at the level of the officials. It's at the level of the uh, deputy minister, senior management, and f- folks that are officials that are uh, down the rung, the ladder in terms of uh, uh, in terms of authority. And so, and so, ninety percent had documented rationale. And what the report showed is that we need to strengthen documentation for the remaining ten percent. And then when you look at uh, when you look at the uh, the contracts that were from the competitive process, uh, what the report found is that there is insufficient documentation for 27 percent of the of the contracts. Nowhere in this study, nowhere in this report does it talk about uh, uh, malfeasance. Does it talk about misappropriation? Does it talk about corruption? Does it talk about fraud? It is about uh, strengthening documentation. And so what I would argue, what I would put forward is that is that to call a minister away from, especially the foreign minister, at a time when you have significant crises around the world, when you have uh, the war in Ukraine that's taking place, when you have the crisis in the Middle East, when you have significant issues that require the minister's attention, to call her to this committee to call the minute, the foreign minister here for two hours to talk about why there's insufficient documentation, I think is a misallocation of her time and her resources and her focus. And I think it does, uh, and it harms the work that Canadians need uh, the foreign minister to be focused on, and it does a disservice. And so this does not, you know, the, what I, one of the things that I've that I've found over the over the years. Uh, is that my conservative colleagues like to interject hyperbole at every turn wherever they possibly can. And uh, and they're doing so again in this situation. And so you have, again, you have a report that clearly states Sorry, Mr. that Kusmer we Chuck, need to strengthen. Mr. Kushmir-Chuck, sure. I'm going to interrupt you because uh, we 